everyone, and welcome to the Science Out East podcast from the University of East London. I'm Carl Smith, Head of Research Excellence, and your host today. So, on this episode, we will be discussing how to make spaces inclusive with, I'm very pleased to announce this, the researchers from UEL who are, work within what we call the purple stars. If you're wondering what are purple stars, you're about to hear a lot more. I'm ready to lead us through that conversation. I'm very pleased to announce we're joined by Kate Annan. She's an artist, she's a researcher, and she's the founder member of Purple Stars. And also Samantha Walker, artist and researcher on the Purple Stars project. So hello, Kate. Hello, Carl. Thanks very much for having us. Oh, pleasure. <laughs> and, uh, and let's just, just dive straight in here, Kate, if that's OK. Yeah, that's fine. So can you tell us a bit more about your journey? I don't mean your journey to UEL today, because no. I know it's been a bit grey and dreary today. Very but wet. But more yeah. about how you came to be involved um, with, with the Inclusive Research Institute known as RICS, um, and also um, how you came to be involved with Purple Stars. And indeed, can you just tell us this what, what do we mean by purple stars? Yes. Okay, I will do that. So purple stars, we created this name from purple, which is the colour that's associated with the economic power of disability. And stars is an acronym. Stars stands for Sensory Technology Art Resource Specialists. And the project um, or the kind of idea of Purple Stars grew out of a research project that was a collaboration, um, an AHRC, that's the Arts and Humanities Research Council grant that we had from 2012 to 2015. And that was a kind of um, collaboration between myself, um, artist who was teaching at the time at the University of Reading. So I was in the art department there. And Rick's Inclusive Research at UEL. And we got together because I was commissioned by Mencap uh, back in the early 2000s to create a sensory trail. So my practice as a sculptor was involving a lot of thinking about how we experience the world through lots of senses, not just how we see, which seems to be a prioritized sense, but thinking about how um, touch, how smell, how sounds and sometimes tastes if, mm. in museums, um, if they're allowed, can really change the way we experience the world. And in my practice, I was making lots of different ways of experiencing museum collections. And one of the things I wanted to do was explore how we could use technology and use sensory information and combine them together in a research project. And that project was called the Sensory Objects Project. So we did that for three years. We started Speak Hall, which is a stately home in Liverpool. And we worked with a brilliant group there called the Access to Heritage Group. Now, they went to lots of museums and decided how accessible they thought they were. And we worked together to create a, a, a sensory trail for Speak Hall. We did lots of work. We thought about how we could interpret the uh, amazing history of this site. And when it finished, uh, the people I worked with, we just had such a brilliant time. And I learned so much about how to see the world from other points of view. Um, everybody said, oh, let's do more. Let's do more. So at the time, I just started um teaching in the art department at the University of Reading. And they said, oh, uh, you have to now produce research for this, you see. And so I was a bit sort of, oh, I don't know if I can, uh, you know, how do I do research as a practitioner, as an artist? And I realized that the practice of creative practice that could be part of this idea of research. So I decided I would write a grant. So that's how I started to apply for this um, AHSC grant. And when I was working there, they all said, oh, you have to go to the RICS Inclusive Research because they're the experts mm. in inclusive um, research. And that's how the collaboration began. So we worked on the project. We, After the first year in Liverpool at Speak Hall, we went on to work at uh, the Museum of English Rural Life, which is called the Merle for short. And then we finished off at the British Museum and we worked with the Tower Project, who we still work with now at uh, Rick's Inclusive Research. And we, ha we created some really interesting technologies using sensory inputs and technology as well. Uh, we did a lot of work with microcontrollers called Arduinos. 
where people had control over the objects that they they were they were inspired to make by the Enlightenment Gallery at the British Museum. So if you're trying to make an exhibit more accessible through all of our senses, not just our our eyes. I, I will say here now, my eye, my eyes are very imperfect. So, how would you begin to do that? So, when you work at Speak Core, for example, in Liverpool, mm. what would you do to enhance the multi sensory experience? So, what we do is, um, and this is a methodology that we developed through doing the three year research project. We started to think about a thing we called a sensory expedition. And we we designed a thing called a cookbook. And it had different ways of how you could approach a museum that focused on a particular sense at the time. And so if we went into a museum, Mm -hmm. one thing that we did, which was really interesting is at Speak Hall, we took bicycle pumps and um, water blasters, you know, these kind of pumps that you have. And we went around and we sucked the smell out of things in the museum. Then we pumped them into little bags, which we wrote down or drew pictures about what that smell was. So I remember at the time it was around um, December and they had amazing Christmas trees and things. And we sucked up the smells of that, put them in bags and had them in um, an installation with a map. And everybody was totally happy to deal with this very conceptual idea of the sense of smell, but connected it to all sorts of memories and stories Gosh. about their past. So that's an example of a sort of highlighting a sense that you'd like, you know, you can use to find out about memory, about deep connections with something. But someone else would talk about the idea of uh, a seashell, yeah. and they might think about that, but rather than talking about, you know, where the shell came from, what creature lived in it and something like that, they might talk about, you know, how it reminded them of their mum and the fact that they grew up near the sea and things like that. So that's very powerful because I think smells can be so evocative. We talked about the Ricks Inclusive Research Institute. Can you tell us a bit more about them, their role and and how you work, uh, your your role within Ricks actually? Yes, so I'm a researcher at the Ricks Inclusive Research and... The whole aim of the Institute is to think of novel and um, different ways of experiencing the world that can include a very diverse team of people on Mm. any kind of piece of research. So, uh, as I say, a lot of my work is thinking about how to use creative practice that will give people the chance to actually have a a chance to put their point of view, to be able to um, explore and, uh, and kind of to be able to converse and talk and uh, share their ideas and their version of the world. Because I think if you don't have the particular version of the world that other people have, mm. it makes you quite blinkered. You So you think you've done enough for somebody yeah. and if you design a certain thing. So this idea of universal design is something that is a core thing of the RICS, okay? So we're trying to think about if we include a lot of different diverse voices um, in the design of an object or of a a methodology or of a workshop, then we're hoping that more, you know, a lot of people will be able to get engaged and be involved in that piece of research or that the thing that we have designed. And that's the sort of core of universal research. And is that also just universal research almost incorporate the idea of uh, democratising research and democratising design? So rather you have the grand designer who sits in his, often this is his sadly, um, precision, mm. he, they, she, whoever will be co-designing something. Yeah. yeah, Co-design and co-production, co-research. Those are all terms that we're really, really keen to embrace. And we use, uh, we employ uh, um, people with learning difficulties yeah. and learning differences. And we are very keen to share that with the world. Fantastic. And so what I'm hearing here, and, and, and going back to Purple Stars, and my sense then, just to check my understanding, Purple Stars is specifically focused on this very much co-design agenda, would you say? Yeah, and also the idea of using creative practice as a, a method. So that's that's a really central part of what Purple Stars have explored, and particularly working within museums. And I think that's something that, you know, we're we're really interested in how we can expand that. Yeah. Um, I mean, Purple Stars, once once we finished the, this is going back, once we finished the AHRC grant, a lot of the people that we worked with um, challenged us as researchers saying, you know, often researchers come and do a project 
money ends and you'll leave and yeah. we still want to carry on yeah. you know um so purple stars was a way of having a kind of a group that we could come together i mean i, I admit that it's still very much linked to projects funding but we have kept it through volunteering through Great. just doing stuff together because we were enjoying each other's expertise and this idea of the kind of collaborative building of expertise so each one of us are much more powerful when we work together and we've seen it again and again as a team you know when we we bring in different people they have such different things so we've worked with people with lived experience mm. of disability people who are experts at cybernetics at vr at you know self-advocacy multimedia all sorts of things and we pile it all in together and a really unique thing comes out of it and i think this is something that we're all really passionate about because sometimes research seems very siloed and we we yep. really really want people to open up a bit more so that in health science-based research the, this sort of idea of having a, a diverse group of people who are listened to who have a voice and who are actually mm. respected has to happen more otherwise we just keep on having the same um kind of core ways of doing things we won't come up with those innovative ideas and that's the power of rick's inclusive research and i think you talked a lot about creative practice and i think that creativity does come from those diversity of voices and is it fair to say that with the purple stars initiative you're making sure that all those different voices have equal weight so the professor the grand researcher their voice does not over overwhelm or or drown out the the people who have lived experience yeah yeah i think that's really key to the the way we work is to genuinely want to know and hear and we all want to pile into the same pot we're not having a sort of top down kind of whatever we never research about somebody else's experiences we always research with our co-researchers -co fantastic so. Yeah. so sam can you tell us about your, your journey I, I know you had a very challenging journey here today but more about your journey to get involved with ricks and the purple stars initiative i started with the tower project that's another day center i used to go to and they led me to do a non-purple star that's the first of it called the romans and that was fun that was really fun to get involved with. And then it was protection. So I, I did two already, actually free, to her life free, because I did um, multi-me as well. So these were non-purple stars before it all was involved. And then I joined the purple stars with my day centre, the Tower Project, more. And then I did sensory objects. And that was the real first project I ever did to got to know Kate. Wow, and are we going? How many years are you going back? It's just ten years, I'm guessing here, Sam. Or yeah, yeah. about that. Twenty fifteen. Yeah, twenty fifteen. Yeah. Fantastic. So, so it was just ongoing, but it was fun doing what I've done because now I could really sell it to other people with a learning disability and a surf issue. So if they want to do it, they can. There's no stopping because it just get that person on the bandwagon. If they want to do it, they can. Yeah. There's no stopping them saying no, because it's it, at the end of the day, if you're good at making something, or you're a good artist, this is the job for you. Okay, can you just tell us a bit more of that first project? What was the thing that... Oh, the Romans. This yeah. was... Tell us, tell us about the one at um, the British Museum with the, um, the box that you made for your mum. It's a show I did. Yeah. And, and it was just... My mum died in 2017, so okay. she had, had no chance to see it. But yeah. I did do a box in her memory of the shell, and that was the project, sensible project I did. Mm. And I put um, seaweed, didn't have no taste, hearing of a shell, yeah, and and, and that was it. You recorded your and story, and I recorded as my well story of my mum. mum. Yeah, yeah. And we also, do you remember we used the laser cutter to print? Yeah, because it, it had a picture of me and me with the shell template. So that was laser cut by Nick. Nick did the whole, like, for everybody who did the project. And it was really fun. It was a real group effort as well, because it was the first time I got to know my group a bit more. 
Brilliant. And what was that project called? Sensory Objects. Sensory yeah. Objects, yeah. yeah. And there, you, but I really like, it was a very powerful story. Your mother had died and you wanted to basically produce an installation, an exhibit about that, yes? Yeah. And it was based in, in the Enlightenment Gallery. So Sam looked at all the different objects. They were all behind glass, weren't they, yeah. in the yeah. museum? And you, My friend you, Ryan had the plate. Oh, I remember that. Because right. yeah. I wanted the plate and I'm glad you got it. There were 12 of us yeah. doing it, weren't there? Yeah. Sam, do you want to just say about when we shared it with the public, what you did? Yep. Yeah, so we took the boxes to the public and we got them to have a go at feeling it, hearing it, and to tell us what you think. Mm. And it was just interesting to find out the research that way. Yeah. And I love the idea you ask the public to tell you what they think, as opposed to the curators, the people decide it, just telling other people. Yeah. And I think that dialogue is so crucial, yeah? Yeah. yeah? yeah. So, Kate, when we think about public spaces, you might think about galleries, you might think about museums, you might even think about parks, but how would you say we have advanced in terms of inclusion with public spaces? I think there is a, a desire to listen more to diverse voices. I think that you know, for lots of public institutions, there's a realisation that your community is is what you need to reach out to. So the museum has to engage with its community because, you know, not only for idealistic reasons, but because that's the, how the money is um, supporting the museums now. So there is a bigger, I think compared to 10, 15 years ago, there's definitely a greater desire to include and to listen to voices. I'd say that in terms of actual physical additions and changes to different public spaces, there's a lot more awareness now. So you have access to a lot more ramps and things like that. Mm -hmm. But the problem is with it is that it's always an addition. So not many buildings, not many architects seem to be really creating buildings that are genuinely just easily accessible. So our world is made to make people disabled. You know, mm. it's it's almost like the design of things is constantly the problem. So and I think that's the that's a big issue with a lot of design and the idea that it's the sort of it's the world around you that makes you find it find life difficult because it's not designed to be accessible for so everybody. in other words the inclusivity ethos is not integral to the building it's always something retrospective that someone's forced by legislation maybe to do exactly that's the problem i think i mean you know as i say things have improved because people are more aware of it yeah. i mean changing places toilets is a, a real thing about that, that i remember people arriving at the ricks this is probably about five or six years ago and this idea about a changing places toilet is, a, you know, a fundamental thing for somebody to have some dignity when they mm. need to go to the toilet. But nobody had thought about that, you know. And even now, it's still sort of a struggle to get buildings to, you know, architects to think about how to fit in changing places toilets as a kind of core thing that you would just expect that to happen. I mean, we're very pleased that we have one at Rick's Inclusive Research and we're just really excited with that because it means now our co-researchers are ha having a respectful and dignified experience when they yeah. come and visit and they can stay much longer than they used to be uh, Can you to. just explain very briefly what you mean by that change in spaces toilet? Yeah, so a changing spaces toilet is different from a disabled toilet mm. in that it offers a hoist so that it can actually lift a person out of their chair and it also has big enough space to be able to do that. Otherwise, people in the past would end up being changed on the floor in a toilet. Gosh. So, and that was like common and that still is in a lot of places. Yeah. And quite often you're told when you're planning these sessions that, you know, yes, of course, there is a disabled home. It's a few miles down the road in the uh, in wherever, but there is one, low, you know, and so it's still still something that needs to be addressed, I think. Yeah. And what do you think then are the least inclusive spaces? Anywhere where um, people are, I think, having preconceived ideas about what it means to have a learning disability or sort of putting everyone into a sort of a categorization, mm. this is the learning disabled or the disabled, you know, because 
every single person is an individual. They have their individual things. So the more that we create an inclusive, diverse set of voices who are deciding what or how to make a place accessible, the more successful it will be. And this is where that co-decide agenda is so critical, I think, Kate. Yeah. So, and hearing this then, what do you think are the main... So, in terms of how we do begin to make inclusive, more inclusive public spaces, what do you think are the main challenges or priorities for us right now? Well, you know, I mean, the budget, the money, it always boils down to money, um, I'm afraid. That means that quite often when you are invited to get involved in design projects, it's almost too late to make a difference. So people will ask you to come and test things out, but they have already, that's already too late. So you need to include people, you need to include enough money, enough budget to support people to come and give their uh, ideas and their designs and their uh, actively take part in the research process. And you need to expect that if you are going to be truly inclusive, this is going to take longer than it would if you were, you, you have to, you have to invest in people's opinions, in people's experiences, whether that's their disability, their culture, whatever it is, these things take time. And often we find that, you know, projects, you, you end up doing things because the budget says it's only this much time and there's only that much space for somebody. Yeah. And so I think that's one thing that if people genuinely want to be inclusive, there seems to be plenty of money for lots of things, but often that bit is like a slight tokenistic thing. So we need to make sure that we can show people how brilliant it is if you use those universal design principles, if you genuinely engage and actually really are genuinely interested in um, lots of diverse different ways of experiencing whatever it is this piece of research is about then you will end up with a much better quality an innovative a whole different way of thinking about the world or the thing that you're designing or you're proposing and that's so important and brilliant so I don't understand why it's so you know underused yeah, because uh, hearing that, because th- there's a key word you're using there is the word experience. Mm. And it's getting our designers to think about what is the experience of the user of the building. And, and don't just assume the user is someone who's able-bodied, is that a fair, or, or someone who is not neurodiverse. Yeah, yeah or they're, they're not going to be the same as you, basically. Yeah. So I suppose that's the power of inclusive research, is to have different opinions. And... And because we all are different, you know, yeah. there's no kind of golden ticket. Yeah. It, it really is the idea of a constant cause and effect trial and error. You know, it has to, it, there's not a perfect thing that just stays set in stone either. That's the other thing. You know, buildings, institutions, we have to face change. We have to be flexible. We have to mm. keep on being willing to face the fact that we've got it wrong and we could make it better. And the idea of Creative practice is all about everything going horribly wrong because yeah. out of that, when you're, when you're working as an artist, it's something that it's horrible, but you in kind of embrace it because you know, there's other alternative ways that you hadn't even thought about. And that's exactly how it works with Purple Stars and with the co-researchers is that we go off into other places that I could never have imagined that we would. You know? Yeah. <laughs> And I love the idea you see here in that, because I think we shouldn't assume a building is built and that's it, it's a static object set in time. Yeah. It can evolve and change it has to. as its occupants change. Yeah, yeah definitely. It has to. Yeah. And I think that's something that a lot of institutions find very difficult to grasp. So what I'm really curious about, though, so it's, it's great to hear that as, a, as, a, as a, your, kind of your foundational project. So you have worked making different spaces such as museums and even pharmacies inclusive. But how did you go about working on all these different projects? So a pharmacy, how did you make a pharmacy inclusive? Well, we we started it from my home. It was my home pharmacy. Yeah. I didn't like it how it was too dark and dense. Yeah. So if you ever walk in Wapping Tower Pharmacy and you yeah. see the people behind you, you wouldn't even know they were there. Wow. 
The but counters were always high. Yeah, it was they? too that high. Was it was too high. Discussed. So you walked, So you you worked with the pharmacy. You made the counters lower. What else did you do with the pharmacy? Um, then from that, I started meeting the staff, and they weren't that kind. Cause it, this was my own area, so yeah. I lived in Wapim. Yeah, and we got. The chemist is right next to me, and it was the first time I went in there, and they didn't even serve me very well. They didn't even know who I was. Wow. And that's how the attitudes changed from there. Well, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, Kate, you're going to jump in then, yeah? Well, I mean, Sam also designed some different artworks for that pharmacy and presented mm. them to the pharmacist there. And created a video for the research, which was called the Architecture of Pharmacies Research, which is a project based at UCL. Wow. And Sam's expertise and experience was really valued by that research project. And also, you know, I think it really altered your relationship and your the way you were respected in the pharmacy, didn't it? Yeah, because it changed after that. Mm. So um, the people now can see who they are. And the bigger change was we, I could able to have my jabs done in there instead of whopping um, health clinic now. Yeah. That was the bigger change. So the uh, pharmacy was really keen yeah. to alter the space, raise the light levels. And then from Sam's video reflections, you also fed into the exhibition that was had at um, the Bromley Bible Centre. Yeah, Bromley oh, Bible Health Centre. So we- but- but what I'd love to know, I mean, obviously, so the, the, the pharmacy in Wapping, your local pharmacy, they've changed their design, but obviously there are thousands of pharmacies. And you can, are any others beginning to adopt this approach? No, not what I know. Well, we, we had an exhibition at Bromley by Bow where we yeah. had an exhibit that showed about a sensory pharmacy. And we also had a whole week of events at the Bromley by Bow Centre where we had pharmacists, architects, and users by experience all talking about their experiences of pharmacies and Mm. how they would like to rethink those spaces. So I think some of the research that you did about your own experiences was really valuable and and it, you know, maybe hasn't changed yet, but I think it's an area that does need to change because pharmacies, pharmacy work is changing, isn't it? Because they're inviting a lot more people to come and taking on roles maybe that doctors normally did in the past. So they yeah. will change, I think. Yeah. We've been invited to show the exhibition that we had, the Architecture of Pharmacies, with the, I think it's, I think anyway, with the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. Wow. In the, they have a little museum. Fantastic. And they they said they would like to show that exhibition again in the future. So... Hopefully things will change. We mm. hope so. But mm. I'm, I'm hearing so much good work from you, Sam, and also from you, Kate, as well. And it's just really, really encouraging to hear this. But I'm going to ask you, Sam, I think I might have already asked us of Kate, but what do you think are the things we should look to do if we want to make a space more inclusive? I think just keep, keep challenging it. Yeah. Because I, I might keep more, but we get first priority not second and sweeping out away now we just want to be heard we just want to go into a museum and 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 just touch things and not in a cabinet anymore and we just want to be first priority so they should make like the queue so we get first choice of it now yeah and make the tickets more cheaper so so we get that first priority if we want to go to see that exhibition we can yeah and you remember sam you had some other top tips didn't you about um maybe giving people extra time that was something you said i said give give us extra time for us to speak and give us our word yeah i I, can i just i'm just gonna go so i'm hearing an extra time i'm hearing about i also you mentioned cost I think making you the first priority, not the second, not the second class citizen, which I think no. many people have felt for so long. But I'm going to have a little light digression. Now, someone mentioned to me something called the Bubble Club. OK, tell us about the Bubble Club. Bubble Club is an inclusive club for people with learned disputes and without. So we have the event on a Wednesday. We've got one coming next, uh, actually this month. On the 30th of October, everyone's welcome to come. Come mix with us service users and see what you think. And we've got the big entertainment. And this is 
in Brick Lime. Yeah. Um, 93 Fate East. Great. And, and so tell us a bit more. So is this at a bar, at a nightclub, at the It cafe? is a nightclub. And, wow. But we help make the party props on a Friday. So we really have a craft element in it. So wow. we help make the party props and then... And then we give it to, and then it goes on their stage, so it goes on the DJ stage, so it makes the DJ who's doing the night more comfortable for them to work. So you're basically, you're taking the nightclub and you're adapting it so it's more accessible, yeah? Yeah. Wow. And what time were you finished at the Bubble Club? 7 to 11. 7 to 11, yeah? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, And uh, actually, who chooses the music? It's the DJs. DJ, yeah? Yeah. And Bubble Club also have DJ training sessions. Wow. Also, you everybody in the Bub Hub, which is the every Friday prep event, yeah. gets a chance to choose bands and what kind of we theme We get a be. say in it. We do get a say yeah. in it. And also my artwork is featured in nearly half the flights. So everyone, not just me, it's just whoever's there. But it's, it's the best club in London because there's no dress code. Yeah. There's no dress code. Brilliant. So you're not exclusive, you're inclusive. And that's such a powerful signal, I think. Um, And I'm just curious to know, and this is what you do, though, with with One Night Club. We talked about the work with pharmacies. But to all our listeners of this podcast, what can they do as individuals to try and produce a more inclusive world and make our public spaces more inclusive. Is there anything you want our listeners to, to think about and even to start doing? Just start getting out there, start mixing with people, Yeah. start knowing where you are and all that, because you can do it with your carry or do it without. Because I started out that without my carers, I didn't even, I didn't have no carers. I still yeah. have my parents. So can you give some tips about for other people? You know, just, what, what just, kind of just try you? it and see where you are. Yeah. And just have fun. Keep mixing with people. You you don't know what you're going to get. Mm-hmm. Don't knock it till you try it. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, and I think, but there's a key message there as well, I think, Sam, is that in London, it's easy for us to all isolate ourselves in our little bubbles um, and to lock ourselves away in our own little cliques, our in groups. But what I'm hearing here is it's the importance of mixing with different people, understanding them better, but also listening to them and involving those people. Is that democratising the whole process of design, of, of, of thinking public space has been truly, truly public? Is that a fair comment? Yeah. Yeah. And is there anything else our listeners... If our, so if our listeners want to get involved, if they want to start working with you, with Kate, with the Purple Stars Initiative, with Ricks, what do you think they can do? Or where should they go? Look on the website, speak to your carers... And see if you want to do it. Come, come to the to the bubble club. Look on bubble info at bubbleclub.co.uk. Brilliant. And Kate has got a space a web page as well, the Purple Stars, and they can look on the website on that as well to see. Just add your comments to the stuff we've done so far. Definitely. Brilliant. And if you're if you are somebody who runs a museum or a space, yeah, yeah. just let th- us know. Yeah, we're very happy Brilliant. to make it inclusive for you. <laughs> Fantastic. And sorry, does does Purple Stars also have a specific website? How we do. Yeah. yeah, it's purplestars.org.uk. Brilliant. So. Purplestars.org.uk. And you shared that the um, Bubble Club website as well, URL. So this is fantastic. Look, we're all very mindful of time. So I'm just going to say here now, thank you so much, Sam and Kate, for joining us today. It's, I, I've learned a huge amount. And I will admit here, I'm an able-bodied person, okay? And my eyesight's a bit limited, but I'm able-bodied. But I, I've learned so much from, from speaking to you both. And it's made me aware. One of the awesome things that struck me, we need to be more empathetic as a society okay and people are different both in terms of their physical abilities but also their cognitive abilities we talk about neurodiversity there are many things we need to consider and i'm an engineer by background i'm not always very good at thinking of these things but it's i've learned a lot today so it's been hugely informative and and valuable for me and this episode was recorded as part of uel's year of science remember please to follow us um, on our on our social media channels 
Please do follow us for updates on future episodes, but thanks very much to Sam and Kate once again. I've learned a lot and I hope our listeners have too. Thank you. Thanks, Carl.